video, we're going to cover the cell cycle, which includes interphase and mitosis. Let's start this lecture by first defining what the cell cycle actually is and why this is important. There's no point in going through the phases if we can't see the beauty behind this process. Remembering the phases is a walk in the park and will be easy for you after this lecture, so let's first define what the cell cycle is. The cell cycle is the process a cell undertakes to duplicate all of its genetic material and divide into two identical cells. It's an ordered sequence of events or a cycle of duplication and division that's occurring in the cell. It's essential for growth, regeneration, and reproduction. For example, a prokaryotic cell that splits is actually reproducing, since a new organism is produced as a result of the process. Unlike with multicellular eukaryotes, they are able to develop from a single cell, the fertilized egg, thanks to cell division. Mitosis is also important in maintaining the genetic stability of a particular population because the daughter cells that are formed are identical to the parent cell, so we're copying the exact genetic material. Again, this is essential for tissue, tissue regeneration and replacement, as well as the growth of a living organism. The stages of the cell cycle are divided into two major phases. We have interphase and the M phase. During interphase, the cell grows and makes a copy of its DNA. It needs to replicate its DNA. And during the end phase, the cell distributes the two copies to opposite ends and divides its cytoplasm, forming two new cells. Now, before we break down the first phase, before we break down interphase, let's review how the genetic material is organized because we're talking about the distribution of identical genetic material to two identical cells or daughter cells. If there are any mistakes during copying or unequal distribution of the genetic material between cells, it can produce dysfunctional cells that may lead to certain diseases, and we don't want that. All right, DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA carries the genetic information of the cell, and in eukaryotes, this is located in the cell nucleus. It's called nuclear DNA. The total genetic information present in an organism is called its genome. In eukaryotic cells, DNA molecules are packaged into chromosomes or multiple chromosomes because DNA is distributed among a variety of chromosomes. Eukaryotic organisms have a different number of chromosomes in the nucleus of their cells. Each chromosome consists of a single long linear DNA molecule associated with proteins that fold the DNA into a more compact structure. So DNA doesn't usually exist by itself. It's associated with specialized proteins that organize it. Beautiful. In eukaryotes, these proteins include histone and non-histone proteins. So the DNA nuclear DNA, and tightly bound histone and non-histone proteins is called chromatin. So we have our DNA molecule, okay, and the bound histone and non-histone proteins, and this, these histone proteins are responsible for the formation of the nucleosome, which is the most basic level of chromosome packing. We cover this in great detail in the DNA structure and function lecture. Now, every species has a different total number of chromosomes. Referring to human somatic cells, any cell in the body except sperm and egg, are diploid cells. They contain 46 chromosomes, 23 chromosomes from the maternal side and 23 from the paternal side. So the 46 chromosomes of a human cell are organized into 23 pairs. Each human cell nucleus contains two copies of each chromosome, one inherited from the maternal side and one from the paternal side. This doesn't apply to gametes, sperm and eggs, and highly specialized cells that lack DNA entirely, such as mature red blood cells, okay? So... The maternal and paternal versions of each chromosome are called homologous chromosomes, or homologs. That is, the chromosome pairs are similar in length, centromere position, and staining pattern, but they are not identical. The only non-homologous chromosome pairs in humans are the sex chromosomes. In males, a Y chromosome is inherited from the father and an X chromosome from the mother. Whereas in females, they inherit one X chromosome from each parent and they have no Y chromosome. Now, 
The number of chromosome sets can be denoted as n. So human sperm and eggs are said to be haploid. There's only one set of chromosomes or one copy. And diploid or 2n means it has two sets of chromosomes, one set from the maternal and one set from the paternal. And when a sperm and egg fuse, their genetic material combines to form one complete diploid set of chromosomes. So chromosomes organize and carry genetic information. They carry genes, which are the basic functional units of heredity. Not only do they carry genes, but these DNA molecules must also be able to replicate and be prepared to distribute equal copies into two daughter cells. And these processes are controlled by three types of specialized nucleotide sequences in the DNA. These are required for DNA replication and chromosome segregation. Let's go through this. One sequence is called a replication origin. This is where DNA replication begins. And there are many replication origins to allow DNA replication to occur rapidly. Now, each duplicated chromosome consists of two sister chromatids. Two copies of a chromosome are called sister chromatids. They are attached to each other by proteins called cohesins, and they are closely attached at the centromere, at the waist here. Each sister chromatid has a centromere, which is the second nucleotide sequence. The first specialized DNA sequence was the replication origin. The second nucleotide sequence is the centromere. The centromere assists in holding the duplicated chromosome together. Again, this is the region where the sister chromatids are most closely connected to each other. And there's a protein complex here called a kinetical, which forms at the centromere, attaching the duplicated chromosomes to the mitotic spindle, allowing them to be separated. And you'll see this later on. Kinetochores, kinetochores recognize the DNA sequence that forms a centromere. Once the sister chromatids separate, they are no longer called sister chromatids, but just individual chromosomes. The sister chromatids are still considered one chromosome as long as they are joined at the centromere. All right, that's the second DNA nucleotide sequence. The third specialized DNA sequences are the telomeres, which are the ends of a chromosome. Telomeres contain repeated sequences that are needed for the ends of a chromosome to be fully replicated. So these are the three specialized DNA sequences that are needed to produce a chromosome that can be replicated and then separated. Let's now subtract complexity and break down interphase. Interphase is the part of the cell cycle when a cell prepares itself to duplicate, and accounts for about 90% of the cycle. In this phase, the cell grows and replicates its genetic material. We can divide interphase into three stages. The G1 phase, also known as GAP1, or first gap, the S phase, which is the synthesis part, and the G2 phase, GAP2, or second gap. We're going to come back to this in a minute, because there's also another phase called G0, which is a non-dividing state or resting period. This is where a cell will leave the cycle and temporarily stop dividing, or it can be a permanent state for some cells. Cells can be categorized in terms of their regenerative capacity into three groups, labile, stable, and permanent. Labile cells continue to divide throughout life, always dividing, always proliferating, and are never in G0. Examples include epithelial cells, the epithelium of the skin, and the GI tract. Another example is hematopoietic stem cells found within the bone marrow. This is why, this is why chemotherapy destroys these cells, because it destroys dividing cells. And cancer cells grow and multiply rapidly. That's why the side effects include hair loss, nausea, and vomiting, because it's destroying these labile cells. Moving on to stable cells, these cells, they don't usually divide, but they can under certain conditions when they are stimulated and they can enter the G1 phase. A great example include hepatocytes or liver cells. This is so beautiful because if you cut a portion of your liver, right? If we cut off a third of your liver, it can regenerate itself because these are stable cells. Absolutely breathtaking, seriously. Liver cells, if you cut a portion of it, it can regenerate itself. Magic, right? Then there are permanent cells that don't divide. 
and they are always in the G0, or resting phase. They cannot reproduce themselves. Even after an injury, they are unable to divide. Examples include nerve cells, skeletal muscle cells, and cardiac muscle. That's why brain damage can be permanent. All right? So those are the three types of cells. Let's now go through the sub-phases of interphase, starting with the G1 phase. Gap 1. We can even call this phase the growth phase because the cell starts growing and getting bigger as the amount of cytosol in the cell increases. What else happens? Protein synthesis occurs. It produces all the essential molecular building blocks that are needed later on. Organelles such as mitochondria, powerhouse of the cell, and endoplasmic reticulum are duplicated. We're going to be making copies of organelles because we're producing twins here, okay? We want them to be identical. We don't want one cell to think it's not as important as the other cell, right? So we're going to be making copies of organelles. Now at this stage, the cell cycle control system monitors the cell's internal state as well as the external environment to make sure that the cell is fully prepared. Before the cell enters S phase, the conditions must be met. We're going to break this down in the cell cycle regulation lecture, but just know that there are certain checkpoints that happen before a cell transitions to the next phase. So the cell cycle control system can either hold the cell in G1 or give it a green signal to continue all the way through the rest of the cell cycle. Now, the G1 phase takes about five to six hours if we're talking about a cell undergoing one division in 24 hours. All right, that's G1. The next phase is the S phase or synthesis phase because before a cell divides, it must replicate its DNA. What's our intention? We want to produce two identical cells. So chromosomes are duplicated when a cell produces a copy of the entire genetic material in the nucleus. This phase takes about 10 to 12 hours. Like we mentioned earlier, DNA replication begins at replication origin sites. There are multiple sites with hundreds to a few thousand replication origins to allow the replication process to occur rapidly. Therefore, multiple replication bubbles are formed, and at each end of a bubble is a replication fork. This Y-shaped region is where the conserved or parental strands are being separated and new strands are synthesized. There are proteins that initiate DNA replication. These proteins identify or recognize this nucleotide sequence and attach to the DNA to separate the two strands to form the replication bubble. And replication will occur in both directions until the entire DNA molecule is copied. Okay, the enzyme helicase unzips the double helix at the replication forks and DNA polymerase synthesizes DNA using the parental strand as a template. It's going to add new subunits to the three prime end of a DNA strand. And we produce two DNA molecules made up of one conserved or parental strand and one new one. And these molecules will be distributed to daughter cells. Okay, here's another way to look at it. We have the parental DNA double helix, and we're going to produce two daughter DNA double helices made up of conserved strand, of one conserved strand, and one new strand. Another structure that is copied is the centrosome, or the microtubule organizing structure. This is the structure that helps in dividing the chromosomes during mitosis. All right? That's the S phase. The next phase is G2, or the gap 2 phase. So we've copied the DNA, and now the cell is preparing to enter mitosis. The cell is going to continue to grow. Okay, so G2 is equal to the second growth phase, G2 growth. Okay, cell organelles and proteins prepare for cell division. There's also going to be a checkpoint to allow the cell to decide whether to continue to the next phase or pause to allow for more time. So that's G2. Let's do a quick recap of interphase before moving on to the M phase. So what are the three stages of interphase? We have G1, okay? The cell grows and synthesizes proteins and copies cytoplasmic organelles. Then we have the S phase, which is the synthesis stage. DNA is duplicated into two sister chromatids and the centrosomes, which form the mitotic spindle, are also replicated. And the last stage is G2. More growth occurs and the cell prepares to enter the M phase. All right? Before the mitotic phase can start, 
there are two important processes that must be finished. The DNA must be fully replicated, and in animal cells, the centrosome must also be duplicated. This is really important because the centrosome will help form the two poles of, of the mitotic spindle that pulls the sister chromatids to opposite poles of the cell. So that's interface. We have G1, S, and G2. GSG. <laughs> Let's move on to the M phase. The M phase is a small portion of the cell cycle and it would occupy less than one hour. All right. During the M phase, the cell divides its replicated DNA and cytoplasm to make two new cells. There are two processes. We have mitosis and cytokinesis. In mitosis, the objective is to make sure that each cell, or each daughter cell, I should say, gets the full set of chromosomes. And it can be broken down into four stages. We have prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase, PMAT. And in cytokinesis, the cytoplasm of the cell is split in two. There's an overlap between the endomitosis and cytokinesis. So cytokinesis completes the mitotic phase. Okay. Let's go through the phases of mitosis, starting with what the cell looks like before it begins mitosis. So in the G2 of interface, this cell has already copied its DNA. The chromosomes here in the nucleus consist of two sister chromatids, but the duplicated chromosomes can't be seen yet because they haven't condensed yet. They are still in their decondensed form. We also have the nucleolus and nuclear envelope, and the two centrosomes, each with two centrioles. This is a type of microtubule organizing center. Now, when we break down the phases, we're going to pay close attention to three things. Let's keep it simple. The nucleus, which houses the chromosomes, we're going to observe the chromosomes, the nuclear envelope, and the centrosomes, which organize the microtubules and form the mitotic spindle. Like I said at the start of the lecture, this is going to be a walk in the park, light work, okay? So beginning with prophase, we're going to take a look at early prophase and late prophase, also known as prometaphase. I know I only said it can be broken down into four phases, but we're going to break down prophase into two, okay? In early prophase, the cell is going to start breaking down some structures and building some up. So what are the three things we're paying close attention to? Number one, the chromosomes. These bad boys, these bad boys are going to start to condense, which is going to make it easier to pull the sister chromatids apart later on. So chromatin is going to organize itself into a more compact structure, and we can now observe the chromosomes individually with a light microscope if we want to. The duplicated chromosomes are going to appear as sister chromatids. Identical chromatids joined at the centromeres. They're joined by the waist here. It has a nice figure, okay? Another thing that happens in the nucleus is that the nucleolus disappears. It's gone. And they say magic doesn't exist. The nucleolus, where ribosomes are made, disappears. Magic. When this is gone, it signals that the cell is getting ready to divide. The next structures are the centrosomes, or microtubule organizing centers. Recall that during interphase, we formed two centrosomes. We duplicated the single centrosome. There's also a pair of centrioles at the center of the centrosome, but they're not really important for cell division. So the two centrosomes are going to move away from each other, and the mitotic spindle starts to form. It's made up of the centrosomes and the microtubules that extend from them. The two centrosomes that produce these microtubules are known as spindle poles. There are also these short microtubules that extend from each centrosome called asters. So technically, the mitotic spindle includes the centrosomes, the microtubules, and the asters. And the spindle is going to grow between the centrosomes as they move apart. That's early prophase. Late prophase or prometaphase starts with the breakdown of the nuclear envelope into small membrane vesicles. This process is started by the phosphorylation and subsequent breakdown of nuclear pore proteins and intermediate filament proteins of the nuclear lamina. These proteins are responsible for the nuclear envelope's stability. Once the nuclear envelope is fragmented, the chromosomes are released and they become even more condensed. So prometaphase starts with the breakdown of the nuclear envelope into small membrane vesicles. 
So now, the spindle microtubules can gain access to these chromosomes and link them to a spindle pole. The microtubules are going to grow with the two centrosomes being at the opposite ends of the cell. Let's take a closer look at the spindle and how the microtubules can bind to chromosomes. Because at this stage, the microtubules are going to extend from each centrosome and they're going to start capturing or attaching to the chromosomes. So let's go through how it does this. Remember how each of the sister, of the two sister chromatids has a kinetic core? This structure is made of proteins that are found at the centromere of each sister chromatid, and the centromeres are the regions of DNA where the chromatids are closely connected. The DNA sequence that makes up a chromosome centromere is recognized by kinetochores. If this sequence is changed, kinetochores cannot assemble, which prevents the normal segregation of the chromosomes during mitosis. So this is really important. So the kinetochores face in opposite directions because they are evenly distributing the chromosomes. During prometaphase, some of the microtubules attach to the kinetochores. These microtubules are called kinetochore microtubules. Microtubules that do not attach to kinetochores are called, you guessed it, non-kinetochore microtubules. They grow and interact with other non-kinetochore microtubules. Okay, so when a chromosome's kinetochore is captured by microtubules, the chromosome begins to move towards the pole from which those microtubules extend from. And then the other microtubules from the opposite pole attach to the kinetochore on the other chromatid. And the chromosomes are going to go back and forth until they align halfway between the two ends of the cell at the equator of the spindle, forming the metaphase plate. And this leads us to metaphase. The chromosomes are going to assemble in the middle. When you think of metaphase, think of the cell saying chromosomes assemble at the metaphase plate. Okay, so that was prophase. Let's move on to metaphase. We're getting close to dividing these sisters now that the microtubules have attached to all of the chromosomes and lined them up in the middle of the cell. Chromosomes assemble. Again, the centrosomes are at opposite poles of the cell and the chromosomes are aligned at the metaphase plate the halfway point of the cell, the center of the football field. The two kinetochores of each sister chromatid are attached to kinetochore microtubules coming from opposite spindle poles. The cell will also check to make sure that all the chromosomes are at the metaphase plate with their kinetochores correctly attached, because we need to make sure that the sister chromatids will be distributed evenly between the two daughter cells. Because if a dividing cell started separating before all the chromosomes were properly attached to the spindle, then one daughter cell would get an incomplete set of chromosomes while the other would get an excess. Both scenarios have the potential to be fatal, so we don't want that. So the cell checks to make sure that all of the chromosomes are attached. When it's all good, we proceed to anaphase, which is the shortest stage of mitosis. Ana equals apart. This is the phase where the sister chromatids say goodbye to each other, they say bye mate, and separate. The cohesin proteins that hold the sister chromatids together are split. This is done by an enzyme known as separase. Separase equals separate. We're separating the sister chromatids. Once the chromatids become, are separated, each chromatid is now its own chromosome. It's an independent chromosome now, okay? It said goodbye to its sister, and it's now an independent chromosome. Then they're going to be pulled towards the opposite ends of the cell. So the kinetochore microtubules shorten, while the non-kinetochore microtubules elongate, separating the poles and making the cell longer. Now you're probably wondering, okay, this is pretty cool, but how does this work? How are we separating the chromatids? How are the chromosomes carried to opposite ends of the cell? This is done by motor proteins that can basically walk along the microtubule tracks and carry chromosomes as they walk. They're just carrying the chromosomes and they're just walking, okay? So by the end of anaphase, the two ends of the cell have identical and complete set of chromosomes. And this leads us to telophase. We're nearly there. Stay with me, stay with the chromatids. The cell is nearly done dividing, so it's going to rebuild the structures that disappeared at the start and break down the spindle. First, the two daughter nuclei form, one for each set of chromosomes. The nuclear envelope appears, as well as the nuclear lie. 
Remember the nuclear proteins and nuclear laminates that were phosphorylated at the start during permetaphase? They are now dephosphorylated, which enables them to reassemble the nuclear envelope and lamina. The chromosomes begin to decondense and the mitotic spindle is broken down. Mitosis is now complete. What's left is the division of the cytoplasm, cytokinesis. Cytokinesis may start in either anaphase or telophase, but usually by the end of mitosis. The contractile ring is assembled, which is composed of actin and myosin filaments, and this ring carries out cytokinesis. Let's go through the differences between animal and plant cells during cytokinesis. When cytokinesis occurs in animal cells, a cleavage follow forms, splitting the cell in half. This process is contractile due to the sliding of the actin filaments against the myosin. And the cleavage furrow is this groove in the cell here near the metaphase plate. Whereas in plants, they don't have cell walls. So there's no cleavage furrow. Instead, the cell plate forms down the middle of the cell, dividing it into two daughter cells separated by a new wall. Each daughter cell has its own plasma membrane. When cytokinesis is complete, we now have two new cells, each with a completely identical set of chromosomes. These cells can now begin their own journey. They can undergo mitosis themselves and repeat the cycle. Before we end this lecture, let's do a quick summary, because like I mentioned, this is light work. This is a walk in the park. So during interphase, we started off with interphase, the cell increases in size and the chromosomes are replicated. The cell organelles and centrosomes are duplicated as well. So think of interphase, this is where the cell is preparing to divide, okay? The end phase involves both mitosis, nuclear division, and cytokinesis, or cytoplasmic division. Let's break down PMAT. In prophase, the copied chromosomes condense and the mitotic spindle starts to form. Then prometaphase starts with breaking down the nuclear envelope and that kinetochore microtubules capture the chromosomes via their kinetochores and start to pull the chromosomes into position. Chromosomes assemble at the metaphase plate. So then at metaphase, the chromosomes are aligned at the equator, the midway between the spindle poles. And then at anaphase, the sister chromatids say goodbye to each other they say bye mate, and are pulled slowly towards the spindle pole to which they are attached. The kinetochore microtubules get shorter as they move apart. And during telophase, the two sets of chromosomes are arranged at the new poles of the spindle and the nuclear envelope starts to form again, the two nuclei form again. And as this is happening, the contractile ring starts to form and the cytoplasm is divided into two daughter cells, each with one nucleus. In the next lecture, we're going to break down how the cell cycle is regulated. Thank you for watching this video. Make sure you subscribe to EKG Science so you don't miss a single lecture. And remember, subtract complexity and slow down. To study the next lecture, simply click the next video or you can view the entire playlist. Hey, stop procrastinating.